I'm Char and this is Off Peak. This is a free little game where you're collecting ticket pieces to get out of town, but mostly just as an excuse to explore this strange train station. And it's full of little details that speak to the current state of games, music and other creative media. Many little stories about people's passions, difficulties making money, and what does and doesn't appeal to different people. A friend of mine recently asked for some of my thoughts about forms of play that are underused or how they could be implemented, or maybe why they aren't. It's a complicated topic and I've been putting together disjointed thoughts ever since. I'll try to give the best answer I can in my own sometimes roundabout way. Society as I know it seems simultaneously in love with and terrified of playing, meaning many varieties of play are simultaneously under and overused. Play as a way to cope with the mundanities of life is exploited by companies, but often poorly explored and misunderstood by individuals. Physical play is common, particularly through sports, but most of us remain disconnected from possibilities for playful movement. Escapism is everywhere, but so often in narrowly defined forms. Exploring sexual play is a minefield, and so on. Video games can feel even more constrained, though I could still spend a lifetime exploring those edges. Any discussion of underused ideas will naturally be a mix of the actual state of things and my own ignorance. I doubt I could come up with anything that doesn't already exist in some circles. I might end up exploring underappreciated play as much as anything genuinely underused. Outside the train station is a protest determined to challenge the status quo, but it feels impotent. One person tries to motivate the crowd, but everyone else is just parroting whatever they say. Write your own fucking battle cry. But then no one's listening anyway. The interchangeable guards are probably ready to step in and shut things down if they have to, but that's it. I struggle a lot with activism. I want to find ways to promote change, but don't have anything meaningful to contribute. Nothing seems good enough. And sometimes it's hard to know what I'd even want. My demands of the world would sound similarly pathetic. I think a lot about forms of play literacy and how they limit the kinds of experiences people can engage with, or that are even recognised as playful. This isn't meant to be a judgement, it's a form of learning we're all involved in one way or another. Learning the many subtleties of language is a lifelong process, and games contain many of these languages we all have an incomplete understanding of. Questions about what games are never interested me. They're just semantic debates, back and forth and around in circles, and everyone's over it. Reminds me of an old relationship, but let's not go there. What interests me more is this sense that's been growing in me over time, that play has much more to do with how you approach something than what that thing actually is. The Noodle Guy could be seen as a sellout giving up music for this, but his approach to cooking is beautiful. He hasn't given up on art. I want to be able to approach everything I do and see in a playful way. I'm particularly attracted to imagination and storytelling, which is an obvious starting point, but still seems underrated. As though any layer of unreality will devalue my experience of life. But it can be a way to engage more fully, not just to run away from the world. And then there's the sense that play is light-hearted. And if I apply it to something more serious, that's insulting and childish. 
I don't accept that, but I don't know what it would take for others to agree. Formalised games can be less firmly linked to being light-hearted, since they're so often tied up in ideas about challenge. But the challenges can still be narrowly defined. Some forms of difficulty are more accepted than others. For a while now I've been stuck on ideas about challenge in terms of difficult themes or unexpected elements. My examples of challenging games are as likely to be Dinner Date or Actual Sunlight as Dark Souls or some twitchy platformer. I was recently listening to a panel discussion about challenging cinema and all the different things that can mean. It made me think that challenge is more broadly understood in that context despite films on the surface seeming more limited than games in terms of the kinds of challenges they can offer. In Off Peaks Reality, people are so into music they can sell sheet music and vinyl records at the train station. The commuters are hungry for art and novelty but it's being fueled more by the desire to have than necessarily engaging deeply with it. Meanwhile, artists continue to struggle, and buying a train ticket is a luxury for most. There's a wide gulf between the wealthy circus and other performers. But at least art feels slightly more equal here than in my world. It's as valid to be passionate about noodles as it is to want to play classical music or to discuss Netrunner strategies. That makes this a nice place to escape to. It feels safe to talk here. Most places aren't like this. A comfortable outing with good friends might not even feel as though everyone's desires are equally legitimate. There are many types of play I'd like to see more of. I'll talk about some of them, but at least when it comes to designed games, it feels irresponsible even asking for things when there probably isn't a market for them. In the end, what I want isn't important enough. Certainly not as important as someone else's livelihood. But it does seem like if even a walking simulator seems out there, then no wonder so many people feel like they're struggling to connect. In the scheme of video games, this is highly familiar. Someone who plays first-person games will immediately understand how to move, look, follow tutorial prompts, and so on. But the challenges aren't broadly recognised or embraced. That can be okay. I can make peace with all kinds of personal preferences. It's mostly when there's a challenge to something's right to exist at all, or to call itself play that I get prickly. But the financial side is also difficult to reconcile. I'm starting to hate the word accessible when it comes to games and game making tools. Accessible to who exactly? Games in general can be hostile and when someone makes something that appeals more to their own sensibilities they're often looked down on for their lack of accessibility to some current perceived core audience. Indie game landscapes are complex and varied, and it's difficult to know what will and won't find its audience. There is a hunger from some players to find experiences they can better relate to. It's not always a lucrative space to explore, but it is vibrant. And when you're in love with that passion, it's easy to resent all the times it fails to sustain people. To want just a slightly bigger slice of that chunky looking pie, and feel sad when beautiful work goes unappreciated and unrewarded. The first draft of this script was harsher, lashing out in an overly aggressive form of self-defense. But that isn't what I wanted. I don't hate the mainstream. I still want to fly over rooftops or watch blood spray from a perfect headshot. I still smile in spite of myself at awkward generic romances and predictable characters. 
often I still find myself appreciating something because it's problematic more than in spite of it. I never have a moral high ground, I just like to pick things apart anyway. That makes me lucky, I suppose, that there will always be plenty of games available I can enjoy. But it doesn't stop me from wishing for other things too. Not everything I've wanted more of is a hopeless case. I've thought a lot over the years about emotional content and using play to explore difficult topics. That feels like a cheap thing to say at this point. It's been well demonstrated by now. It's not underused at all. But now that more people have become aware that games are allowed to be about things, and there's a market for emotion, Currently, we're in a phase where a chunk of games are reveling simply in their ability to splurt emotion all over you. I love them anyway, but I look forward to the point where emotion in itself isn't treated as novel. The links between play and emotion are much more interesting when feelings are more than a simple goal. Over time, I'd expect to naturally see more thoughtful use of emotional themes. That doesn't have to involve subtlety, but subtlety is one of the things that's not doing so well right now. I don't really want to talk about Sunset. That story is being picked apart from every angle already. But one way off peak is similar to Sunset is that it feels like someone wanted to make a space filled with some of their favourite things. It's the appeal of exploring a friend's bookshelf or music collection. Sometimes, always, their tastes very different to mine. That's something worth loving too. I'd like to see more work on aimless forms of play, though it's difficult to explain what I mean by that. In this footage I know where I'm going, and it loses a lot of the actual sense of exploring. But even the first time I was here, these ticket pieces were directing me pretty strongly. The Stanley Parable might actually be a better example. Not so much at first when there are very specific aims and achievements, but once you get past that there's a lot more you can engage with or not. The museum section is the kind of place where you can spend some time. The aimless thing might also be why I have some appreciation for Mountain, although it's wackier than I would personally prefer. Most of the forms of underused play I can come up with are a hard sell. I'm interested in ways to incorporate more imaginative play into video games. I like when a game demands as much of my brain as it does of the computer, and not just in the sense of solving puzzles. When there were more limits on graphics and processing power, it was more of a given that the game world was partly a creation of your own mind. But it still is. I add elements to games I play all the time, but setting out to encourage that is another matter. There are some obvious examples of games that demand some creative input, or let you form your own connections. Elegy for a Dead World is essentially a series of writing prompts in game form. Everything there rests on what you're willing to create for it. Thirty Flights of Loving involves piecing together the events that happen between the video cuts you get to see. And really anything with a lot of symbolism can be good for piecing things together or forming your own sense of what it means. Like Silent Hill games. But I feel like we're so far off exploring the potential of this kind of play. A game that requires you to fill in gaps isn't necessarily incomplete, but would people understand that? And as much as I enjoy using my imagination, it's also hard work. 
That seems to be where a lot of my ideas fall apart. I don't know how many people want to work hard for their play. I'm also fascinated by the underexplored links between play and ritual. Vespa 5 is my favourite video game example, but there are others. Anna Anthropy recently released Wish for Something Better, which is described as a single player role playing ritual. It's a kind of non digital game somewhere at the intersection of therapy and imaginative play. Could also be considered a spiritual exercise, but that's up to you. It's a sweet thing, but also maybe a confronting or embarrassing thing, depending on your history or perceptions of this kind of practice. I like this part, moving up the dark staircase. Such an attractive mix of exciting and unsettling. It's dark, but also like being in a star field. The art's provocative, but more through unconventional beauty than shock value. The music is tense, but attractive. I don't want to stick around to disturb the couple making out on the landing, but I approve of their choice of location. Seems like it would be easy to be overcome here, though maybe it's just a good place to hide. In general, this section seems to contain those who don't want to be seen. I want to be unsettled. Another form of play I'm really interested in is sadistic game design, potentially meaning a genuinely painful experience, not just more traditional game difficulty. I've also seen people call it abusive game design, but that implies a lack of consent which doesn't sit well with me. It's always a kind of implied contract between player and designer, which can take many forms. Games are so often about the player's power and mastery that it's difficult to find games that are genuinely about a loss of control without being set up as something to overcome. When weakness is present, it still tends to feel like the designer is along for the same ride in some sense. Sometimes I'd like to feel like the game designer isn't on my side. Or that they are, but it's not going to be in a smooth way. And not just in an I want to be the guy kind of way, although that is an example of a contract where the player agrees to be screwed with a bit. I'm sure I'm missing plenty of meaning in this game, although it's intentionally open to interpretation. But I still feel like it has a lot of straightforward elements. It's marketed as a near future setting, so for all it's slightly fantastical and exaggerated, it is still tied up in current ideas, particularly about art and what might become of it in the future. The cookie seller might be one of the stranger aspects of Off Peak for some people, but they also seem to encapsulate something important. Whenever someone takes screenshots of this game, they'll probably feature in one of them. The cookie seller's approach isn't actually so different to the noodle seller. They both have something they want to capture through the art of cooking. They have that creative drive. But this time they're stuck down in this abandoned part of the station, rarely getting to see the sunlight. The commuters won't come and spend their money here. The cookies are free anyway, of course, but they've gone stale. This station have lots of things that invite me to take or eat them, but this is the only person who's actually happy for me to do so. There's some sense that it might be unwise to eat those cookies. 
You don't accept food from strange people on abandoned train platforms who whisper at you and hide beneath dark glasses. But I don't believe they're dangerous. One of the first things they say is that people think they're a crone. It's easy to interpret this character as having something to do with the importance of gender or transgender status in your place in the creative landscape. Or maybe how people view homeless, poor or mentally ill people. I'd play a game about baking sunrises into biscuits. That's as good a representation as I'm likely to find about my desire for new sensations. But I'm not so interested in eating biscuits, even when they are formed from special moments. That says a lot more about me than it does about cookies. I still try to spend some time with things I dislike. You never really know what you might find. This station is a carefully curated space, subject to the whims of a single man. But hey, he knows what people like. He gets good ratings. Art is wonderful and also deeply corrupt. Success, certainly financial success, can be fairly arbitrary. Something beyond talent and marketing strategies. And that's terrifying. No one wants to think about how making something good isn't enough. I'm interested in playing more with identity. In some ways, video games are already full of this. There's plenty of opportunity to either project parts of yourself into a game world, or try on the identity of an avatar. Maybe have more of a partnership or a rivalry between you and the character you're controlling. Personal games can be a chance to experience part of another real person's life. Occasionally you can experience more than one perspective, switching between them or simultaneously. Unmanned was an interesting example of simultaneously experiencing more than one aspect of someone's life. And that contrast makes the issues more unsettling. So I probably can't say identity play is completely underused, but there's a lot more to explore. People can be rather attached to who they are, even if that sense of self is sometimes a complicated or multifaceted thing. That video games encourage people to step outside themselves sometimes is one of the remarkable things about them. Board Game Bar is the last major location I need to visit here and it's full of characters who aren't on quite the same wavelength about things. It's always a difference in skill or interest level. Most board games require that cooperation between people, but it can be difficult to make that work in a way that's satisfying for everyone. For the giants playing Netrunner, it's frustrating, but maybe an okay part of learning. The barman says they've been at it all afternoon, so they're determined if nothing else. Multiplayer play is all a bit mysterious to me. I may be going to play some board games tomorrow, and I've kind of been avoiding that for a while, despite it being an event full of people who know and care about me. I'm not sure what it would take for these games not to feel like a risk. Of course, I might just be making excuses for my poor numbers brain. I like to offload that onto computers or other people. At the middle table, there's another form of failure to connect going on. The kind where you want to be part of the things they're into, but it doesn't land the way you might have hoped. When he's right about her being into this game, it just highlights that he's not on the same level and they can't talk about it. And when he claims something about another activity she would love, he's dead wrong. It was just a projection of who he thought she was. It's difficult to just dabble in board games because there's so much about compatible skill levels. 
In competitive play, it's difficult for unbalanced games to stay interesting. And in the few cases I've met people who handicap themselves, they've been patronising as fuck about it. In co-op, skill differences can make players redundant, which is possibly worse. Though it's also like the socially acceptable way to just watch a game, so I can enjoy that. The play involved in observing is something I feel protective of. How many people say that a game is about playing, but a movie isn't? Unless you add an external mechanic, like a drinking game. But watching in itself can be playful, whether through some formal rule system or just in a more organic way. When a board gaming group is dominated by dabblers, they might have closer skill levels, but it's easy for things to become drawn out and unfocused. I still find it easier to play among experienced people. They have more idea what they want and the logistics of it. The third table of board gamers feels very familiar. A situation where one person has all the passion, and the others are to some degree distracted, frustrated, or don't get it. It's an uncomfortable conversation to watch. And maybe not a particularly playful experience. Not because the game is heavier than some of them appreciate, but because the players are all over the place about it. I wonder about more unbalanced kinds of games where people can engage in different ways and it doesn't just fall apart like this. In Super Mario Galaxy, Player 2 has a limited role of just helping collect star bits, or occasionally stun an enemy. I assume it's designed to allow younger kids to play, but when I was exhausted and struggling it was a way I could still participate in something, so I've always appreciated it for that. You can take on different roles in an MMO party, but they aren't usually as distinct as all that. It's a long time since I've been qualified to talk about World of Warcraft, but over time raids became smaller and at least some roles became less specialised. To open content to more people and remove some things that were considered boring. Some things didn't fit as well with being a powerful fantasy warrior, I guess. Behind the bar you can look outside the station, which is surrounded by water. Although it's not animated, the water is choppy, like this station is a calm sanctuary in the middle of something more violent. At least here people have made a priority of being playful or creative, despite all the things that can make that difficult. It's time to get out of here. The secret passage might expose some of the artificiality of this place, how carefully it's been designed to maintain an illusion. It's a nice try. The best part's still coming, like I might have needed a reminder about why I even care. This is one of my favourite video game moments of the last few years. Outside the sun is setting, painting the stark train yard in a fiery backdrop. It's almost deserted. There's no train parked on this side of the station. But there is this one guy in a suit dancing his heart out beside the train tracks. The commuters, however shallow and materialistic they might have seemed, do have the same essence, the need to feel and express themselves. Of the people in this station, this is who I aspire to be. So it's okay if no one else is watching by now, just us and the sunset. This isn't quite the game's end, but it's where I'd like to end things. But I'll let it play out from here and you can choose for yourself.